Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, episode 4.18, The Pause in Politics. Before we begin for today, I want to give you all a quick heads up on my social media presence. Now, I am not exactly winning awards for my social media engagement. And that probably will not change, though I always promise that I'll try to do better. However, if you do wish to follow the show, all my old social media links are still valid. However, I am adding a new one. I set up a Threads account a few days ago that I am going to try to be a bit more active on. Now, if you would like to follow the podcast there, you can search up the U.S. Political Podcast on Threads, and it should pop up for you. And I will go ahead from this point forward and start including a link in the show notes. So, now with that out of the way, on to today's episode. By the time 1771 had rolled around, the colonies had been mired in a crisis with Britain for at least the last six years. During that time, there had been plenty of civil disobedience throughout all of the colonies. For some colonies, this meant angry remonstrances to the crown, reminding the British of their rights. In other cases, it meant literal mob action. Effigies were burned, houses were destroyed, and customs officials were harassed. This really is the story of the first portion of the imperial crisis. As we discussed in our last episode, By this point, the more radical elements in places like Boston were trying to avoid violent confrontations, like what had occurred during the Stamp Act. However, the practice did survive. By the beginning of 1770, violence was becoming more widespread in Boston as fights between soldiers and colonists became common. This would accumulate in the death of five colonists on March 5th, when British troops fired into a crowd of angry protesters. Surprisingly, though, following the events and the trials of 1770, everything would just calm down for a minute. That is not to say that nothing was happening and suddenly everybody was happy with British policy. Rather, there is a noticeable break in the action, where everybody seems to step back and collect their breath. This week, I am going to spend our time looking at events between 1771 and 1773. Because even though things might have eased off some, events were still marching steadily forward. In many ways, what follows the end of 1770 was a period of calm that was at least somewhat reminiscent of what had followed the Stamp Act. This period would in fact become known as the pause in politics, because compared to what we have seen previously, things do seem to slow down a bit here. However, unlike what had followed the Stamp Act, there was far more uncertainty about what had occurred. The Stamp Act, at least initially, was an unequivocal victory for the colonists. In that situation, they had managed to get the British to withdraw the hated act. Though the British did say face through the Declaratory Act, surely that was all it was. Except, of course, we know that the Declaratory Act was not merely put into place so that the British could feel better about themselves. It was a very real thing that the British were serious about utilizing. Throughout the colonies, there had been a general desire to avoid the mob action seen during the Stamp Act riots something which came with obviously differing results. Rather than burning effigies and destroying houses, non-importation was the goal. We discussed back in episode 4.15 that by the time of the summer of 1770, everybody was tired of non-importation, and the entire program melted away with little to show for it. By the time that the trials of the Boston Massacre had ended, Everybody was exhausted from what had been an undeniably turbulent couple of years. 
There were, however, several other reasons to explain why there is a bit of a lull in the action. The Townsend Acts were deeply unpopular in the colonies, as we have well seen by this point. As it turns out, they were not all that much more popular in London itself. The Acts had always been a nightmare for the British. Though a test of wills was underway to see who would blink first, the non-importation agreements had a definite effect upon the British economy. There was a dramatic reduction in trade that was acutely felt in Britain. More concerning for the British is the fact that in the absence of trade with the colonies came an increase in colonial manufacturing. This shift threatened to make the changes to the economy permanent, something that the British were desperate to avoid. The leadership in London also understood just how antagonistic the Townsend Acts were. This brings us to the real crux of the problem in London. It was readily apparent that the Townsend Acts were causing nothing but a headache. They failed to produce any real revenue for the empire, as they hardly were being paid by anybody and did little more than enrage the Americans. However, the question had shifted not to one of economic policy, but rather of parliamentary supremacy. Backing off of the Towns Index could reinforce the American position and would threaten to further undermine parliamentary sovereignty over the colonies. Regardless of this, however, Lord North acknowledged that the acts were doing nothing but causing unnecessary animosity, and that they needed to go. In 1770, Lord North took over at the front of a new ministry, and quickly set to the task of repealing the much-hated duties. North recognized that the Townsend Acts were more trouble than they were worth, and that, though he needed to tread carefully, they needed to be repealed. North, though not terribly interested in conflict himself, would lead the government for the next 12 years, meaning that it would be North who would have to deal with the reality of losing the American colonies. That is all in our future, however. For now, North sought to get rid of the Townsend Acts. Of course, there did remain the serious problem of just how North could repeal the Townsend Acts without acquiescing to the American position. The struggling East India Company provided that solution. The East India Company actually did not support the tea duty remaining in place, as they were not wanting to get involved in the squabble. However, despite their wishes, the tea duty survived, while the rest of the duties were repealed. Under this plan, North had, at least in his own mind, managed to kill several birds with a single stone. Pragmatically, the colonies could continue to prop up the struggling East India Company. Politically, North could essentially reiterate the British position laid out in the Declaratory Act. Parliament still held sovereignty over the colonies. They were going to be the ones to call the shots. North could save face here by showing that they were repealing the Townsend duties, not because of anything that the colonists had done but because they were poor economic policy. After all, if we were just caving in, we would have repealed all of the duties and not left that one on T. At the same time, North had given the colonists at least something that looked like a partial victory which would, hopefully, mollify the Americans. Now, to be sure, the duty on tea was not left in place because the East India Company depended on it. Rather, it provided Parliament with an opportunity to flex their muscle and authority. There was no universe where North or his government could agree to a complete repeal. Really, therefore, there was nothing that made the duty on tea any more or less special than any of the other provisions. It is likewise noteworthy to make a note of the dates of these debates over the duties back in London. The debates over repealing most of the Townsend duties were taking place in March of 1770. So, you know, right at the same time that Captain Preston's men were firing into a crowd of Bostonians. 
Of course, North had no idea of the tumults occurring simultaneously back in America. With the towns and duties being repealed, except for the tax on tea, everybody moved back away from the precipice. In the year following the repeal of the duties, there was an immediate economic benefit for British merchants. From 1771 through 1773, there was considerable growth in trade from what had existed prior to the non-importation agreements. After years of avoiding imports, the colonists were desperate for British goods and were happy to have them back. Although on the surface, everybody seemed to be taking a collective deep breath. This should not be mistaken with thinking that anybody thought that the crisis was over. Was there still complaints and animosity over British imperial action? Yes, there absolutely was. However, people were tired, and no new taxes or bills were put into place that would absorb the colonists' anger. While the colonists accepted the momentary victory, nobody was mistaken into thinking that they were in anything other than a lull, rather than at the end of the crisis. In the years immediately following 1770, there would not be an event akin to the Stamp Act, or even the non-importation agreements that had proliferated throughout 1769. However, despite the fact that tempers had temporarily cooled, everybody did remain on edge, aware that eventually these problems were going to return to the surface. Throughout the colonies, there was noticeable tension between royal governors and assemblies. By 1771, neither side had any trust for the other, and everybody was wearing that animosity on their sleeves. These were not violent confrontations. However, there was no question that there was far more resistance than you would have seen just a decade earlier. These feelings of frustration and the lack of trust between the sides extended beyond politics and spread into other areas of life as well. With regards to religion, a battle had been brewing over the past decade. The issue stemmed from concerns over the appointment of an Anglican bishop to the colonies. We have talked before about the fact that there had never actually been a bishop in America. This means that even the Anglican church had operated with a surprising amount of autonomy. The colonists, especially in the north, feared further Anglican incursion and involvement. Even in regions where Anglicans had more influence, the American churches had been doing their own thing at this point for over 150 years. Nobody was looking forward to the boss showing up for an inspection. Though a bishop never actually did arrive in North America, this is an important thing to understand. It shows how in matters beyond politics, there was already a notable separation taking place. When the revolution comes, therefore, even the Anglican Church will prove to be a far weaker link at binding the colonies to the crown than the British had anticipated. It is also during these years in the early 1770s that we begin to see the movement expand in its scope of grievances. Assuming that you have been keeping track, the colonists had remained loyal to the king. Parliament were the ones who were busy usurping their rights. But the king, well, he was their protector. Well, the colonists would write angry remonstrances to Parliament, reminding them of their rights as British citizens. They simultaneously wrote to the king, requesting that he protect them from the machinations of an overreaching Parliament. However, things were slowly beginning to change. Following the Boston Massacre, Thomas Hutchinson moved the general court out of Boston and into Cambridge. Those in Boston complained about the move, to which Hutchinson defended by stating that he was following the king's orders. 
What ensued was a back-and-forth battle between the colonists and Hutchinson, with the colonists either denying that this was the king's prerogative or arguing that illegal actions were invalid, regardless of their source. Samuel Adams stated that an unconstitutional order ceases to be binding. This seemingly minor fight over holding the general court in Boston or at Harvard helps to expose just how deep the rift had become and to what extent the colonists were placing the authority of their own representatives over that of the crown. Of course, we know that this calm is only temporary. In 1772, everybody would be shaken from their malaise as events in Rhode Island would quickly get the entire crisis back into gear. One thing that was up and running in the colonies was a very healthy smuggling industry. This, to be sure, helped take some of the sting out of that lingering duty on tea. Smugglers had clashed previously with colonial officials. We have talked about the smuggling allegations in Boston. However, smuggling was not just a hobby of the Bostonians, but was something going on throughout the colonies. In 1770 New Jersey, a customs collector who had the audacity to investigate a ship unloading its cargo received a beating from the sailors for his trouble. The customs collector's son, who was himself a collector, was tarred and feathered for his trouble. Though smuggling was a widespread problem, it was an oft-forgotten event in Rhode Island that would help reignite the crisis. In Rhode Island, as elsewhere, there was a vibrant smuggling trade going on that customs officials were eager to shut down. In order to get better control over smuggling in March 1772, the Crown deployed two small ships to the area. One of these ships, the Gaspy, was commanded by Lieutenant William Duddingston. Duddingston was not phoning in his responsibilities. He was very much dedicated to his duties and took stopping smugglers very seriously. This had led Duddingston into clashes with the colonists before, who were less than excited about his professional zeal. This accumulated with Duddingston being threatened with arrest by a local sheriff. Admiral Montague, as Duddingston's boss, stepped in to try to make things better and let the colonists know that they would be taking a strict approach with smugglers. Montague made clear that anybody trying to rescue a ship captured by the Gaspi would be hanged as a pirate. Unsurprisingly, the local population was put off by the response of Admiral Montague. The colony's governor, Joseph Wanton, reminded Montague that he was the guy calling the shots and that he would use the sheriff in any way that he saw fit. Wanton viewed the actions of the British as usurping his authority, sparking a battle that would continue between the governor and the customs officials throughout the remainder of the spring. Jurisdictional questions aside, the colonists were now itching for an opportunity to make clear what they thought of Duddingston and Montague. For a time, the Gatsby would become a very real headache for Rhode Island merchants, as Duddingston very aggressively policed Narragansett Bay. Among the ships that he would end up seizing was one named the Fortune, a ship that he towed to Boston so in Admiralty Court could hear the case, despite the fact that jurisdiction should have remained in Newport. I bring up the Fortune because the ship was owned by the firm of Nathaniel Green and Company. Born in 1742 to Quaker parents, Green was incensed at the actions of Dunningston and quickly sought legal action against him. Although he would not be involved with the events to come, as it related to the ultimate fate of the Gatsby. We, of course, cannot completely skip over Green's involvement either. In a few short years, we will catch back up with Nathaniel Green, 
as he would become one of Washington's most trusted generals. It is impossible, therefore, to look at the running with the Gatsby and not consider the road it would send Green on and just how it would influence his thinking in future events. Rhode Islanders would get their chance to voice their grievances on June 9th, when Lieutenant Dunningston found himself aboard the Gatsby in hot pursuit of a smuggler. The Hannah, the sloop that Dunningston was chasing, moved out of Newport Harbor and proceeded up the Providence River. The Gatsby followed. As the Gatsby gave chase to the Hannah throughout the rivers, Dunningston made the mistake of running his ship aground near Pawtuxet. The colonists now had their chance. At around midnight, a group boarded the Gatsby, tied up the crew, and lit the Gatsby on fire. During the ordeal, Dunningston would wind up getting shot in the stomach. Although Dunningston would survive the wound, he would earn himself a court-martial, though he was ultimately acquitted of wrongdoing. With the Gatsby smoldering and Dunningston himself healing, an obvious political wound had been opened. For months before this, there had been the fight over jurisdiction and authority between Governor Wanton and Admiral Montague. Now that the Gatsby had been attacked, all of those existing wounds would become that much more exacerbated. This brings us to an important distinction that we need to make regarding Rhode Island to better explain what comes next. Rhode Island, unlike Massachusetts, did not have a royally appointed governor. Rather, the governor was an elected official. This is how you end up with one of the colonial Rhode Island governors, Stephen Hopkins, also being a signer of the Declaration of Independence. This means that the governors of Rhode Island were not necessarily as loyal to crown policies as, say, a Francis Bernard might have been. Governor Wanton was a smart enough guy to realize that this is not something that he could just ignore. A royal sloop had been burnt and a customs official had been shot. However much this may have personally satisfied Wanton, he needed to do something because he was aware that his actions were being watched. Governor Wanton ordered a full investigation into the matter. He issued a proclamation, offering a large reward for the names of the perpetrators. He frequently wrote to both Admiral Montague and to Hillsborough about the work he was putting in to capture those accused of burning the Gatsby. Really, though, all of this was always meant to be nothing more than mere window dressing. Wanton needed to show that he was leading an investigation and was doing his due diligence. However, to be perfectly clear, he was not actually at all interested in those responsible being discovered. What Wanton was interested in was putting on the necessary show. However, his elaborate theater aside, there were several outstanding questions. Montague and Wanton were both arguing that they had jurisdiction over the matter. Montague relying on the fact that a royal sloop had been lost, and Wanton arguing that it was lost some 30 miles inland, thus well inside of his territory. Things became further muddled when Montague arrested Aaron Briggs, a local slave, who confessed to his participation and, far more concerningly, gave up names of co-conspirators. In an attempt to shut Briggs up, local judges issued a warrant for his arrest with the hopes that they could get him back into more friendly confines. The problem was that when they attempted to serve the warrant, the British Navy refused to comply. The name of the game therefore switched to the colonists doing all they could to discredit the jailed Briggs. Back in London, the initial plan by Hillsborough was alarmingly straightforward. Some months before a law had passed, making burning a naval ship a capital crime. The penalty was death. This act was not passed in response to the burning of the Gatsby, but it certainly could be used to address it. Well, this was alarming, 
Hillsborough would again abruptly change course in late August when he instead decided that the offense for burning the Gatsby would be high treason. Most importantly for our story is that Hillsborough also intended that those responsible be brought back to England for trial. This started a lasting battle that would come to define the next stage of the imperial crisis. It had long been precedent that a person was to be tried by a jury of their peers in the location where the alleged offense took place. How, after all, would it be possible for somebody on a jury in London to understand the life of somebody living in Rhode Island? However, under the law at the time, those accused of treason were to be transported back to London to face trial. Furthermore, the announcement that the trial would be in London under charges of treason was a clear indication of how much authority Hillsborough was planning to extend to Governor Wanton. Now, realistically, the passage of the initial act had nothing to do with the Gatsby. Further, that decision to charge under the Treason Act had little to do with the Gatsby itself, and more to do with discussions over the enforceability of the law that was taking place throughout British legal circles. Despite increased efforts to create a commission to figure out who was at fault for the burning of the Gatsby, nothing would ever come from it. Despite everybody's best efforts, which included promised pardons and rewards for information, nobody was ever officially linked to the Gatsby's destruction. Although nobody would ever actually be officially held responsible over the burning of the Gatsby, this massive erosion of colonial legal rights was not something that was going to slip under the radar and go unnoticed. Mercy Otis Warren noted that the decision to transport people across the ocean for trial was an extraordinary political maneuver. Arthur Lee of Virginia feared that the Gatsby would be the event that would send everybody tumbling over that precipice that they had been walking towards for years. He worried that it would spark a civil war between the Americans and the British. Arthur Lee was not the only Virginian to be deeply concerned about the British response to the Gatsby. A group made up of Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and Richard Henry Lee formed a committee of correspondents. The purpose of the committee was to transmit information more efficiently between the colonies about threats to their liberty. The hope was that this would help make sure that the information being transmitted between the colonial legislatures was both accurately reported and to ensure that everybody was working with the same information. The plan would prove to be very successful, and within a year all of the colonies, except for Pennsylvania, would form a similar committee. This was a significant development for the American colonies. Think back to last season when we discussed the French and Indian War. The resistance between the colonies towards anything resembling meaningful cooperation had been profound. That is not to say that in 1772, everybody would jump on board with Franklin's Albany Plan of Union. However, it is certainly worth noting that since the Stamp Act, everybody had become far more cognizant of their collective strength. In Massachusetts, at the same time that the Gatsby affair was ongoing, there was a growing battle over who was going to pay for Thomas Hutchinson. We have discussed before that Parliament had changed the source of the governor's pay from the Assembly to the customs duties. If you will recall, the problem that Parliament had with the Assemblies being responsible for the payment of colonial governors is that it gave the Assemblies a degree of control over the governor. Should the Assembly not approve of what the governor is doing, they could just withhold his pay. Parliament, wanting to ensure that the governors were not swayed by such trivial matters, like getting their paycheck, declared that the governor's pay would now come through the customs duties thus sidestepping the legislature. By the summer of 1772, Parliament ordered that Governor Hutchinson and Lieutenant Governor Andrew Oliver's pay be taken directly from the duty on tea. 
They then expanded further to include superior court judges. Throughout the colonies, there was a general movement in the direction of making sure that all British officials in the colonies were being paid directly from the British and were thus independent from the manipulation of local colonial assemblies. The question over colonial pay had been lingering for some years. However, by the fall of 1772, it had risen to the forefront. As more and more officials were being paid by the duty on tea, it reflected less control that the assemblies had. In an era where every single threat to the colonial legislative power was taken as an attack on individual liberties, this was not something that could pass unnoticed. Among those who took particular offense to the growing list of officials being paid by the duty on tea was Samuel Adams. The duty on tea had proved to be a major source of revenue for the crown. Even with smuggling and non-importation, we are talking about a serious amount of money being brought in. Samuel Adams, as he had done so many times before, would make the call for resistance to this practice at the beginning of October 1772. On October 5th, he published in the Boston Gazette an article calling for resistance. He argued that by having judges on the British payroll, they would act as mere stooges of the empire. Adams framed this as nothing less than an outright assault on justice in the colony. As soon as the tract went out, Adams began pushing the story and doing everything in his power to get people to take up the cause. During town meetings, going on both before and contemporaneously to the tract by Adams, there had been increased pressure directed towards Hutchinson to call for the assembly. Recall that the town meetings were not actually anything official. The assembly had been disbanded, and the town meetings were merely a workaround. Well, these meetings did provide a good sounding board, they lacked in any actual authority. Thomas Hutchinson had no plans for calling the assembly to business. Hutchinson had obviously not forgotten about the grief that the assembly had given Francis Bernard. He was not interested in going down that same path. In response to the refusal of Hutchinson in calling the legislature, Adams' next move was to create a committee of correspondence. This is similar to what we had discussed just a few minutes ago that was coming out of Virginia. The difference here is that the Virginian Committee of Correspondence was taking a broad look at things and was looking to start up a committee that extended between the colonial legislatures. Adams took a far more micro look at the same idea and instead of expanding his gaze to the entire colonial apparatus, he focused specifically on Massachusetts. This committee would be formed to encourage the spread of information throughout the towns of Massachusetts. This is not to say that the committee would not expand beyond that, because it did link into that greater committee structure being proposed by Virginia. Rather, it clearly shows that Adams was trying to expand his influence throughout the Massachusetts colony. There was at least some level of pushback directed towards Samuel Adams and his attempts to drive events. John Hancock, for example, was opposed. However, that may have been more of a result of personal differences with Adams, rather than any major difference in ideology. Regardless of Hancock's dissent, the motion did pass with ease. The first thing to come out of this was the votes and proceedings of the freeholders and other inhabitants of the town of Boston in town meetings assembled according to law. This would later become known simply as the Boston Pamphlet. The Boston Pamphlet opens with a declaration of the rights of the colonists. It states at the beginning that every natural right not expressly given up or from the nature of the social compact, necessarily ceded, remains. This is a document that is steeped in enlightened ideals. From discussions of the social contract to the invocation of rights under John Locke, 
What the Boston pamphlet does is that it moves the overall argument forward and proposes a new outlook. The argument previously had been on British encroachment of rights. However, this pamphlet presents everything as being a far more coordinated plot by the British. The end goal of this plan was nothing short than the enslavement of the American colonists. This pamphlet touches on so many of the things that had been bothering the colonists for years and wrapped them all into this overarching theme of British prerogative on enslaving the colonists. Religion comes up as rumors and fear continues to fly of a bishop being sent to America to get control over things something which we talked about earlier today. We have talked previously about the invocation of the term slavery and its importance. Recall that in this instance, the argument is everybody is born with natural rights. As a part of living in a society, people voluntarily cede certain rights. For example, you are giving up your property when you pay taxes. However, in exchange for your taxes, you're receiving services from the government, say, like the military protecting you from outside invaders. Most critically, you are giving this up of your own free will. The loss of one's ability to consent to the taking of property? That is slavery. As was par for the course by this point, the actions of the British were being presented as the worst evil to ever befall a free people. The pamphlet states, This will, if accomplished, complete our slavery. So if taxes are to be raised from us, from the Parliament of Great Britain without our consent, and the men on whose opinions and discussion our properties, liberties, and lives in a great measure depend, receive their support from the revenues arising from these taxes, we cannot when we think on the depravity of mankind, avoid looking with horror on the danger to which we are exposed. Clearly, the Committee of Correspondence was not taking a subtle approach. News of the pamphlet spread throughout Massachusetts as more and more towns endorsed Boston's position. By the time that the spring of 1773 had rolled around, towns throughout Massachusetts had either endorsed the Boston pamphlet or created their own writings, which all shared similar sentiments. The period of time between 1771 until the beginning of 1773 had seen a cooling of tempers throughout the colonies. As historian Robert Middlecuff describes it, it was a time of drift for the American colonies. The outrage of the Boston Massacre had at least cooled somewhat. The Non-Importation Act had come to an end. The Townsend duties had been mostly repealed, except, of course, for that duty on tea. There was little new that occurred during those years to really ignite another period of action and civil unrest. Although no crowds of civilians were fired into by British soldiers during these years, they were not without important key events that would help set up the late portion of the Imperial Crisis. Important lessons that had been learned during the Townsend Crisis would begin to manifest here. The Committees of Correspondence, for instance, marks a major turning point in intercolonial communication. Now everybody was talking to one another, be it at a local level, as suggested by Adams, or the more widespread legislature-to-legislature -legislature network that we see come out of Virginia. Efforts had clearly been made to get everybody acting on the same page. It is not difficult to see how these committees of correspondence would lay down a path towards the Continental Congress, the first of which was now less than two years away. During these years, the writings begin to change as well. For the first time, we see the colonists take issue directly with George III. Throughout this entire crisis, the king had remained the great protector of rights, a check on the machinations of that overreaching parliament. However, the colonists were now beginning to look more closely at the crown and the role that the king had in all of this. 
the Boston pamphlet shows just how out in the open everybody is now operating. The pamphlet presented the colonists with a British empire that was acting with the direct prerogative of enslaving them all. Finally, the burning of the Gatsby clearly illustrates that even in a moment of relative calm, violent actions could still take place. Although the Gatsby is largely forgotten today, it was an event that helped shake the colonies out of their malaise and bring everybody back to the realization that there remained an ongoing crisis. It helped bring new questions over legal jurisdiction into the ongoing debate. Did the Crown have the ability to send people thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean for a trial back in London? Was it even possible for an American colonist to receive a fair trial in London? If you were to ask this question in the colonies in 1772, the answer would have been a resounding no. The Gatsby fully illustrates that even now during a period of relative calm, tensions remained high and that events could easily be set off that could potentially reignite the crisis at a moment's notice. Next time, we move our story into the final phase of the imperial crisis. As the bonds between Great Britain and the American colonists fray, events are going to unfold that will deepen the growing rift until the entire thing comes crashing down. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and that you are staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we discuss plans for a tea party. <laughs> <laughs>